So what I want to talk through today is a, a bit of the journey I've been on over the last year and some of the work we've done, um, especially looking about how we increase adoption um, and financial inclusion. And a key part of that has been working out how we fit and how Finneract and PHE and other solutions fit within uh, DPI. So I, I've got a lot of areas to cover and I'm going to go through them to try and build that story up as we go through. So first of all, what I'm going to look at is what is a DPI and DPI? because three-letter acronyms are great and lots of people have different definitions of them. Um, so DPI is digital public infrastructure um, and the easiest way to think about this is to think about normal infrastructure. So think about your highways, your water systems, um, even your electricity networks, uh, your national grids, etc. These are all um, well-known sort of public systems that are there to generate socio-economic growth but it's exactly the same in the digital space. There's key digital public systems that are needed uh, to underpin socioeconomic growth. And three of the core areas that have been identified are around identity, uh, payments, and data exchange. There's probably more that will be done as this sort of develops forward, but they're the, the three key areas that have been uh, discovered so far. And through having those common public systems, then services can be layered on top to be built. Um, so this is a really good um, representation. It's not seven layers for those that use, used to know the OSI stack. It's only five layers, but hey, it's still pretty good. So um, at the bottom layer, obviously, you've got the key governance and foundational things that need to uh, operate across the, the DPI. Then you've got the core DPI building blocks. Um, so as we said, these would typically be identity, payments, um, consent-based data sharing, um, and other emerging services. Above that, you can then layer the applications that reuse those building blocks um, to create applications going out. You know, whether it be you know digital education, whether it be you know taxation systems, whether it be you know um, things to support um, jobs, skilling, um, agriculture, etc. And then above that, obviously, you can layer the different delivery modes. You know, is it online? Is it semi-online? Is it offline? You know, are you needing to mobiles, uh, etc. So by building up those layers, you're making sure you're not repeating uh, the bits underneath and you can really all use the core infrastructure. Um, so why do these support financial inclusion? Um, well, some of the, uh, the, the typical use cases uh, that we've seen are things like, you know, one-time cash transfers from disaster zones. You need to get money out there quickly. Um, these sorts of systems can underpin that and, and bring it out. You know, equally, um, you know, government payment systems will look a bit more in detail at some GTP uh, use cases that we've worked through, uh, supporting uh, maternity clinics, you know, giving them government payouts. Um, but equally, it's about giving people the way to actually start their own financial journey, um, whether they're saving for a life event uh, or, or not. And through this, what we have to make sure is what we're doing is very inclusive. You know, this isn't about connecting people that have bank accounts, that isn't inclusion. It's about being able to connect people via whatever payment modality they need, you know, and it needs to be vouchers um, because they don't have a bank account, you know, it might be mobile. You've got to think of the, of the systems we need to interconnect inter with uh, to get that inclusion. And obviously, underneath all that, then what we can do is start hitting some of the sustainable development. Um, such as no poverty, um, you know, work and economic growth, uh, reducing inequalities, etc. Um, so I also mentioned the DPGs. So just like digital public infrastructure, uh, the other category is digital public goods, um, and these are open source, open software, open specifications, open data, open AI. As we heard earlier this week, that is an ambiguous term sometimes. Um, that help um, achieve the sustainable development goals. Um, the Digital Public Goods Alliance um, actually tests and accredits um, solutions that want to go for, for DPG status. Um, Finneract, actually Finneract is one of them that has DPG recognition. Um, Mifos PHEE um, recently uh, got accredited as well. Um, and as you can see, there's many other solutions out there in the space and many uh, well-known um, solutions that are DPGs. DPIs 
don't require you to use DPGs. You could use proprietary systems. It would still work. Um, but it's certainly fair to say if you want to you know, get the real advantages within your digital public infrastructure, then you really should be using DPGs. And that's where a lot of the focus is um, at this present point in time is, is using DPGs within it. Um, so when we start to look at uh, more towards the financial sector, where those DPGs fit in, so as we say, within the payments landscape, you can look at you know, and, uh, et cetera, um, and they can provide that core banking and cash management systems. Um, equally, uh, payment hub is traditionally been viewed in, in, in the blue, um, enable orchestration um, and DFSP participation. And then what we've worked on over the last year is extending out uh, PHEE to cover this, this green block effectively, which is enabling it to much more uh, interact with government use cases um, and scenarios, um, addressing some of those financial inclusion points. Um, and there's some key capabilities in there which I'll, I'll step through. So how does this um, enable financial inclusion? Well, Firstly, it reduces um, the barriers to um, increasing instant payment adoption. Um, it enables effective GDP payments, that's government to person payments, uh, which is probably the, the primary first use case that would be looked at from out there. And then through that, what it does is develop a wider financial inclusion, which then means other services can be layered on top and it brings people uh, in that um, have So what I'm going to do is step through some of the improvements that we've done over the last year. I've talked about the, the green block earlier. Um, so uh, I don't know how many of you are aware of GovStack. GovStack is a program run by the ITU. Um, and it's a framework of standardization that effectively is a digital public infrastructure framework. Um, so it identifies uh, building blocks. Um, and within that there's you know, identity, for example, ID building block, um, there's registration, there's another core building block, um, information mediator, um, so that's data exchange, um, payments, um, obviously. And the work that we've been doing within GovStack over the last year um, has been laboring out what those use cases are and how those building blocks interact, um, building out specifications for each of those building blocks um, but also, um, there's a number of uh, entities working with GovStack to make sure that there's candidate solutions that can be adopted um, as we're going out and talking country engagements. Um, and for payments, MIPOS has been involved with using both Finamac and PAGE uh, to uh, do those use cases. And the key enhancements we've had to do there um, is uh, around an idea account wrapper, um, around how we handle bulk disbursements, um, Voucher management, uh, an area that didn't exist before in the solution. Um, P2G, which is person to government payments and how we handle those, um, as well as um, updating the, the UI that currently exists uh, for PHE2 to handle those new functionality that's uh, coming in. Um, so, what is the ID account mapper and, and why is it important? Uh, the ID account mapper um, really is uh, where we capture within the payment system, and it's key that it's within the payment system, uh, the modality and the financial address um, of the uh, beneficiary and tie it back to the beneficiary ID, the, the functional uh, ID of that beneficiary. Now, why is it important we hold that data in the payment system? Well, what you don't want is every time the registration system is trying to send out a payment, you don't want it sending financial address every time across. But you also want to put power back into the hands of the individuals. You know, they might want to be able to switch their bank account. They might want to be able to switch their modality which they're receiving payment. They don't want to have to go back through and re-register every time. They want to be able to go and update what their functional address is um, assigned uh, uh, what their financial address is, what their payment modality is assigned to that beneficiary ID. Um, the beneficiary ID as well is unique to a programme. So uh, if you could be uh, a person that's receiving multiple payments, for example, from the government, you might receive one uh, for um, maternity benefits, you might receive one for education allowance, for example. 
you'd actually have two IDs, um, so you could decide where different payment methods are, are going to for you. So you could decide you want to have this one, you could decide you want to change your, your, your mobile money account to another. And that's what the, the ID account back service does. Um, and when we built that, we built it as a separate module um, within PHEE so that although PHE can use it, it can actually be taken out as part of the open source code in our repos and be used in other solutions in the future. It's time to make it more useful. Um, the next one we did was uh, the bulk processor capabilities. Um, so we've had to look at that and transform how it handles um, batches of transactions coming in. Very large batches will come in for uh, programs and it's important that we can actually split those down in different ways to cope with the, uh, the systems of the payment modalities of the users. So we've introduced the ability to a switch on volume. Uh, you know, you can set a limit of five, you can set a limit of 5,000 transactions in each batch that's going out from your registration system. But we also um, included within that the ability to go to our account mapper find out financial uh, details for the beneficiary, understand which DFSP that is going to, and equally batch the transactions according to the, the DFSP it's going to. Um, it also does the funds validation. There's no point in sending a load of transactions out to uh, different uh, DFSPs to, to be fulfilled if the funds aren't in the originating account. So it does that validation and makes sure the funds are there and ready to, to go out first. It also maintains an end-to-end -end reconciliation um, so that we can go into the system and we can see what the status of that transaction is. Has it been fully processed? Has it been progress? The next area we uh, developed was the voucher engine. Uh, we could see for many of the use cases and many of the uh, country implementations that um, GovStack had been looking at um, there is need for vouchers as a payment modality. Now, the voucher engine, it's, we need to differentiate from the physical voucher. So the voucher engine is the process uh, that we've created to be able to issue a voucher, uh, um, be able to redeem a voucher, activate a voucher, cancel a voucher, uh, and effectively a voucher has its own life cycle. What we're not doing within this is creating QR codes, printing physical vouchers. So the voucher engine will create the information, the serial numbers, uh, the, the voucher numbers, etc., and then it exports that out via an API to whatever the method is um, that you need to be able to, to use to physically produce um, those vouchers. And then we've introduced, um, as I said, person to government payments because the other use cases we're seeing is for taxation collection, um, construction permits, for example, and, and, and other scenarios coming in. Um, so within that, we've created a bill pay module. Um, that bill pay module has a filler table, um, which each filler is given a unique ID. Um, that can be appended to the invoices, which can go out through the normal systems for distributing the invoices. And then when that invoice uh, payment comes in with reference, that unique ID on the front um, is uh, differentiated, and so we can do the reconciliation of the payment back through the payment system. Um, we can cope with that whether it happens to be sort of invoice driven or the cost to pay this work for those that pay for both. Um, and we can also support um, voucher can use the payment within that um, uh, person to government um, scenario. There's a lot more detail, I'm not expecting to see this um, But there is links in the slides which will be online afterwards, um, so you can go and find more details of specification. And, and uh, and then uh, we've got the, uh, the UI we've um, updated. Um, so within this, what we've firstly done uh, is now integrated the UI with um, Pico. Uh, this enables us to uh, be able to assign roles to users that are logging in. So you can imagine you might only be able to uh, view one program within a system, so you need to have your own role. Um, equally, uh, you might have different levels of privileges for what you can see. Uh, we've also introduced the, the view rights to be able to see the ID account map as the data is populated in there. We've got the ability to understand the vouchers and see the status of them 
and also the ability to create vouchers. So this enables you to upload a batch file, um, and it will create that voucher and send it out to um, uh, wherever you specify. It can be done by API, or it can be done through the UI. And then we've um, updated how payments can be viewed. So you can see the, the main batch, you can see the of the batches that's been split down into, um, and its values. You can drill down into the transactions themselves and see the status of the transactions and what's happening. Um, so overall, um, the architecture uh, has expanded a bit more out for the AGE and how it interacts with Finnoact. Um, and as you can see, we, we use a lot of other systems and components within it. Um, and all these are open source um, systems and components. So the other area we've been um, looking at on this journey is around um, Interledger and the Interledger protocol and how that could maybe work with um, Finamact and would it help address um, DPIs and financial inclusion. Um, so the Interledger protocol um, itself, um, it's been around for a number of years um, now. It's not well known, I would say, in general outside of sort of the technical communities. Um, and certainly if you start to talking within uh, sort of the adoption communities, most people you know, think of Interledger and then think you know, currency and bitcoins and don't think about what it's actually about. Whereas what Interledger and Interledger protocol really is about is applying a much simpler mechanism to be able to send payments and uh, to be able to um, be sending that regardless of whether it's you know in a, in a cryptocurrency, whether it's in a normal currency, and to be able to interact between those different currencies. And it does that um, through a very simple uh, prepare and fulfill reject type cycle um, and connectors. So it's about expanding out um, a network of connectors and making it much more um, simple to do those cross-currency um, conversions. So, does ILP help? Um, so, yes, we think it does. Um, it makes it easier to transact, mainly in the uh, multi-currency scenarios. Um, it makes it uh, much easier to, to make transactions neutral, uh, whether that be to you know, the account type, the modality or the currency or the person. Um, so what we've um, started looking at, and some of my colleagues uh, here in the room are looking at it with, with us now, um, is how can ILP and um, Finamact um, be aligned? Can they uh, be together? ILP has none of the, the Finamact capabilities um, around current accounts, loans, you know, property configurations, etc. Um, so one option would be to build an ILP connector uh, within Finamac to be able to um, make all that accessibility to all the features of Finamac out to the ILP network, and equally vice versa, um, be able to get ILP connections into Finamac. Um, so we've looked then at how does this apply to, to DPI. There's a number of testing principles within DPI around interoperability, you know, minimal reduce uh, reusable components, you know, diversity inclusion. There's some areas that we need to look at and develop further, but actually, in general, there's a pretty good match uh, between ILP um, and some design principles um, and how we could actually apply it to DPI. So, as I said, it's a journey we're on there, um, and, and the next steps are to uh, work through those designs a bit more. Um, important thing really is to increase adoption. We need to have a reference architecture out there, and we need to have a way to be able to demonstrate that in reality. You know, as we said, Internet Protocol has been around for a number of years and it's developed, um, but people aren't going to be able to, you know, adopt it unless they can pick it up, touch it, feel it, see how it works, with it, etc. And that's the next stage we're looking at at the moment. So. Then what I wanted to do was sort of wrap that picture back around to is it real world now? You know, are there real world use cases for, for Finamax and PhD and is it starting to drive financial inclusion, uh, whether through DPI or other methods? Um, so uh, I've got a few examples to talk through. So one example is the, the, the One Acre Fund. So this is a, 
Pan-Africa um, agricultural lender. It's got more than one million um, shareholder farms. Um, and it's gathering in about two million repayments for loans via Impesa mobile payment. Um, that is built um, on a payment hub PE. Um, in AWS, it's got a Polycom uh, adapter um, that's been built into it. And what that really has driven is benefits in terms of visibility and control, um, but also improved performance. And as we've heard recurring this morning, you know, using these open source solutions actually lowered the transaction costs. And that really benefit and passes directly on to the uh, end users. Uh, the other example um, is uh, I'm going to talk through is about uh, CIBI, which is in the uh, Mexican government. Um, this is using Finarac underneath it, um, and as you can see, that is providing third-party connectivity and it provides traditional uh, banking for digital banking uh, needs. And then the other area we've um, started to have a, a large number of conversations, and this seems to be snowboarding and getting much more increasing um, over, the, over the past month or two, is around shared infrastructure. Um, and this again ties back to what we're saying about financial inclusion, um, because what we're seeing is uh, to enable that financial inclusion, it's fine having some of the overlying um, uh, switches and systems like that. You actually need the ability to be able to give people real accounts um, and be able to access in areas that are not access before. So trying to enable the digitization of MFIs and SACOs is key to that journey of integration. Um, and uh, we've been having those conversations with them and the shared platform is the easiest way to uh, get people to be able to get up to speed, get them to adopt it. And then that lowers the cost of them to do innovation. So one of the things we've looked at recently um, is the ability to use, for example, behavioral uh, risk-based decisioning systems um, to enable people that don't have a credit score to be able to get loans, etc. And you can invest in those sorts of systems because you're not investing as much uh, in the core banking. And then the final area we've, we've looked at is around harmonization. Um, because there's lots of standards out there, there's lots of ways of doing things, and there's, if you want to have things here, you'll see you know, there's 20 different ways to do some things um, already. Uh, but what's key if we're going to be able to expand out um, and address this and give confidence to adopters is that we're on a path uh, of alignment um, and integration, whatever choice they take, so they're not going down um, a stovepipe. And we're starting to see that very much in the DPI and DPG space. Um, recently, uh, there was ID for Africa um, that occurred out in um, uh, Cape Town. And actually, there was a whole track dedicated there um, to, to adoption and harmonization um, of services. Um, and there's an acronym that's now come out. Um, it's not one I personally like, because I come from a database background, and DAS means something else to me. Um, but DPI as a service, uh, the new DAS, um, is, is one way where this is being done. And we're starting to experiment within uh, Mifos, and we've adopted and incubating a project at the moment, uh, Modifos, which is looking to ease this deployment of a DPI service using components um, even outside of the, the Mifos community uh, to be able to, to get it deployed quickly. We're also working on standardization. Um, and we've worked with GovStack, we've worked for uh, a number of years with GPP Connect as well, and we've looked at how we can uh, align those two specifications, and we've recently um, published with our partners a, a white paper on how it doesn't matter whether you're looking at GovStack, it doesn't matter whether you're looking at GPP Connect, actually those APIs can be aligned um, in a fairly simple way with a, a, a wrapper layer. Um, and I'd like to assure you the QR code does work on this um, for those that tried the QR code yesterday, which does now work on the poster. Um, so, in conclusion, um, I've got a few things to, to conclude. So, I think the first one, and it's been a journey, as I say, I've only been involved with me for just over a year. Um, and it's really clear to me how much Finneract um, and other services on top of the PHEA can be enablers for, for financial inclusion. You're lowering the cost of the, of the core solutions, you're making it more accessible to people, 
Um, and key to that is you're actually enabling digital software. You're not actually tying them into something that's tying them into a long-term proprietary um, engagement. We've expanded the scope of these to be able to comply with DPI, and I think DPI is a term and, and, and a way of optimizing these systems is something you're increasingly going to see um, over, the, over the next year. Um, and through um, shared infrastructure, we're starting to see a real uptick. Um, and it really is an exponential uptake in the amount of engagement we've had over the last few months um, in terms of being able to enable last mile digitization. That's really meeting uh, the, the needs of those people that don't have um, access to financial systems at the moment. There is some challenges. Um, we need to continue and expand out those use cases for DPI. Um, government to person and person to government is, is not enough. We need to make that wider. Um, the big one I think you'll hear regularly is we need to get upstream contributions back into the community. There's lots of work you can hear going on around. By getting that upstream back into the community, we can then take that back out um, to enable financial um, inclusion. We're looking at how we can integrate with new innovative services such as AI and data science. We need to do it in the right way. And then what we need to do is maybe address that adoption and the ease of adoption um, for people. And that's why we need to start looking much more at how we make our solutions easier to deploy people that don't have you know, a huge uh, knowledge to be able to get it out there. Thank you. <laughs> You're born with me on a very whistle-top story. <laughs>